Okay, the first question is, when did you first hear of Otway? Um, when I was at school, um, I remember seeing the uh, famous uh, Earl Grey whistle test and uh, seeing him falling off his speaker. And then at school, we, we, everyone was singing, uh, beware of the flowers because they're going to get you, yeah. But I'd never seen him live. And uh, the first time I saw him live was um, when we were working together at the gate uh, in, um, in Battersea. And uh, Lou Stein had put him in, in the company because I don't, don't know how he got... Uh, John has this knack of finding the right person to sort of, you know, get on to the next thing that he wants to do. And um, Lou Stein uh, was a sort of up-and-coming direct American chappy who, who, who uh, was running one of the, 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 the better fringe, better known fringe theatres in London. He still didn't get paid or anything like that, but John wanted to um, uh, get into acting. So he was in the company and so was I. And um, uh, one night, and Lou Stein was putting him together with somebody else to write a show for John, you know, specifically for John. And um, anyway, John said one night, he was very shy and sort of, I think it was because it was his first uh, bit of theatre, he was felt a bit left out, you know, uh, not very lovey, you know. And um, anyway, he said, come along to the show tonight because he was doing it in the theatre that night. And I remember sitting down there and only sort of knowing the single, not really knowing what, what he was about, and coming, crying, laughing, and coming out with my, you know, my sides um, in, in pain. Uh, from having seen him, because I mean, I think you know he's lots of other things, but he he's always brilliantly funny. And it's funny because when you when you go to a gig, and I've seen loads of them, you know, hundreds, I think. Um, you look around the audience, and you can it, it, he just has this knack of warming an audience. And uh, you look around, and people are just smiling, you know. And it's it's um it's very rare you get trouble at an Otway gig, or you know, or uh, people that don't like it, you know. People he wins people round. And um, so that was when we first met, really. What attracted you to work with John? Was there, a, a, is because you just happened to be sort of pushed together or was there, a, a, you know, um, you'd heard of him, but was there more than that? I've heard of, uh, I had heard of him, and but didn't, didn't realise that it, um, what he was doing was, was so funny, really. And, and I'd always been a fan of uh, people like the Bonzos and sort of eccentrics who in English music and probably in music generally it don't get treated as as well as I think they ought to be you know that, that anything not mainstream even if it is you know uh, British you know it, it doesn't doesn't sort of get the the respect that's due you know I'm sure if if, if Otway or the Bonzos or um, you know people like that were in any other country they'd be sort of like heralded a lot more than they are but as it is they, they sort of you know, they sort of keep going, really, you know. Um, but so it, it was his approach to music, and we did get on, you know, and he's, he's, he's quite ambitious, you know, and, and, and very good at enthusing you. But what he does is he enthuses you so that you do it, you know. And um, uh, he tends to sort of then say, all oh, right, well, they're doing that, you know, um, which is what happened w when we wrote Verbal Diary, that... Um, uh, Lou Stein was trying to get him in with somebody else, and that didn't work. You know, um, they weren't just weren't on the same wavelength. And uh, he and I got to, together, and you know, we sort of uh, we got got on very well and became mates very quickly. So um, he and I were writing this thing, and uh, we didn't know what it was. In fact, in February before we were putting it on, we went up to Edinburgh to do a um, uh, a uh, a publicity tour for it and we hadn't even sat down to write it and we went up on the coach and we thought oh we'll bash some ideas but um, John and I are politically miles apart you know so we spent the whole journey arguing about politics and it was sort of like you know the times of the miners strike and things like that and uh, um, John's a sort of I, I suppose enterprise um, generation you know I mean, he's not an entrepreneur. I think there should be a word, enterpriser, because he gets these little ideas and he sort of sets off and decides to do them and gets people to enthuse and then gets them to do the work, you know. Um, so we, we sort of, uh, we went up on the coach to Edinburgh 
and uh, got no sleep, uh, wrote nothing. And then um, I saw another side to what way, which is that um, he's a brilliant, I don't know, fibber is the word, but uh, he can uh, concoct things, you know, where, where um, he got asked uh, by these people, these interviewers in, in, on radio in Scotland what the show was going to be about. And he, he sort of went on for about five minutes, you know, saying, oh, we're going to have elephants in it and it's going to be huge, a, a huge set and there's going to be a full orchestra and things like that. So people are going, oh, wow, you know, must book up for that, you know. And uh, then sort of on the, uh, I, you know, when we were going back, I said, so is that what it's about? And he said, what? And he makes it up on the spur of the moment, you know, and then so we had to get down to actually writing it, you know, and, and, uh, and doing the script. And, and the set, um, which was a sort of feature. I think he had an idea for a diary, you know, and um, things happening around that. Um, I mean, having said that he doesn't do anything, he's got a sort of a great sense about what he can make funny. And um, there are areas that he won't go into, and there are other areas that he's completely at home with. So when we were writing it, he'd sort of say, hmm, not sure about that, you know, and um, so you gradually, you sort of, you, you find out the parameters that, that the humour will work in, and, and um, uh, that's, that's very creative. So, I mean, with a, I suppose he does sort of influence rather quite a lot, you know. What were the main headaches working with John, was it? in the way you've explained them, that you know, he sort of delegates pretty well. I, mean, I know exactly how you, yeah. how you feel there. Well, it was, all of it was sort of, and like a lot of things that Don, John does, uh, are on favours. You know, um, he bumps into somebody and finds out that their dad has got a light bulb shop and he tries to catch light bulbs for the show, you know. And um, it, it's infectious because we had no money to put the show together. We were doing down and out in Paris and London as a, as a main thing, and um, as the main show that Luke Steiner directed. Uh, so that was getting our ticket up to Edinburgh. And uh, but we had had no money, and I knew Rick Mail and Aid Edmondson. We'd been at, at uh, university together, and so John said, "Well, why don't you see if they can lend us a few bob?" You know. So I went to Rick, and I, I think Rick lent us about a grand, and to actually get the set built and publicity together and things like that and um, that's how it happened you know things do get done but n never directly always you know round the houses and through mates doors and you know but they do get done you know which is extraordinary really <laughs> what did Rick think of uh, John oh R Rick was a real fan you know and has been for a long time and um, you know, came came to a few gigs and things, and uh, um, so so th that was good, really. And I mean, one of the things that we managed to do, although we didn't make any money out of it, um, we did manage to pay Rick his money back. You know, which was uh, you know a good. Um, so Rick was happy. <laughs> what were your main parts in um, Verbal Diary? What were you playing, or was it a, a series of? I don't know the play myself. So I played two characters. Uh, Phil and Eric, and um, one lived in the same um, house as John's character, and uh, the other worked with John because I was playing both. They never met, and so there was. We had a scene where I'd go off stage and have a conversation with myself. You know, it was all. It was sort of quite, uh, quite clever, really, mucking about with theatrical conventions, and uh, the set was quite unique. It was all 2D. So if you were having a, a cup of tea, it would be a, a 2D cup of tea and just a board like that with the tea um, uh, full and then you'd, you'd drink it and then turn it around the other way and it'd be empty. You know, so uh, there was things like that. There was a lot of invention going into it, you know. And um, uh, just one guitarist who um, played guitar. <laughs> and what was John's main role in the um, John, as always, played John, really, or as a, a version of John, um, who was a sort of uh, um, a chap who fancied a girl, and she lived in the uh, in the house, and they never got it together, and 
he wrote things in his diary about her, and uh, hence the title. And, um, uh, you know, there were things that, that um, characters would nick his diary and read it and make fun out of it. It was all very sort of, uh, very light and gentle, you know, um, which I think is, is John's forte, you know, that's his sense of humour, really, and uh, which I found appealing as well, you know. When you look back, that, that really sort of furthered not only your own career, but John's as well. It sort of pushed mm. him into more the acting side, which a lot of his show was really, as you say, it's John acting. Um, mm. Now, you went up for, you, you both, did you both join a, a casting agent then, or were you with a casting agent? Uh, John got a very good agent out of it. Um, I was already um, with an agent. I was in a cooperative agency, so I wasn't sort of looking for representation. representation. But because he got a good agent, he managed to get all the casting directors from London to come and see the show in the gate. And from it, um, I mean, I got loads and loads of work, as did John, you know. Um, for instance, the Hubbard, Hubbard Casting, who were one of the top casters in England, you know, came to see me, and they always brought me in for castings, and John, you know. So it was great, you know, from from having... and so he, He's very clued up, really. I mean, he, he sort of... He has this appearance of being sort of quite dopey, but, I mean, don't be hoodwinked, because he knows, I think, what he's doing. And he knows that if you put that in, even if you don't make any money out of it, that... If you want to, uh, you know, if you want to get on, you've got to do maybe something, take a loss in order to benefit in the future, and it did pay off completely for for both of us, you know. Me too. We're sort of so physically unlike that, um, you know, and for commercials, they they sort of go for a look as much as uh, you know what you can do. Um, so we never really, although we went up, if there was a sort of general one where they wanted somebody funny, uh, we'd both go up and. We had a little coffee club with people who always went to the same um, castings, and uh, so we all used to meet up. But I don't think, don't think he ever said, "Oh, you you got that one, I didn't," you know, or vice versa, you know, because he'd get some and I I wouldn't get them, and you know. Have you worked with John since? I mean, this is ten years ago now. No, no, I haven't. I've gone sort of separate ways, you know. John, really. <laughs> I think he should have his own show. I mean, I think, uh, um, it, you know, sort of a, a late night slot where it, it's sort of like over the top and has his. Uh, I mean, I think he'd be good as a sort of, you know, the total opposite of David Letterman chat show. But it'd be a great, I mean, it'd be a really brave thing for a, for a television company to do uh, is, you know, to say, right, we've got John and he's, you know, you know in his own right. Um, and then have him interviewing people, and uh, um, and then uh, you know have have bands on as well. You know, I think that'd be a good idea. That's sort of along the lines of presenting, but I can't see him playing Hamlet. You know, or um, and also you know he hasn't done much theatre, so his opportunities to learn, I suppose, are are, are limited. You know, but in in the, I think there's a sort of um, There are, there, there are a, a number of parts that he could do, you know, um, and I think that's what he's sort of aiming for. I don't think he'd ever be a sort of superstar, or, but um, he may be, you know. <laughs> How would you sort of somehow write him in? I, don't, I suppose he could be a long-lost relative of Nigel's, really, you know. Um, she might be a, a slow, slightly... You know, uh, um, the dopey side to Nigel is, is uh, you know, present in John as well, you know, so I suppose there could be that side. I don't think he'd ever be a Mitchell brother or, or you know, he'd be the, the missing link Mitchell brother. Or <laughs> what, what makes him a success? In He's extremely hard-working, really hard-working, and... Um, he has this, the, uh, the, I mean, the things that he's he taught me when, from watching him in countless gigs is that he has this ability, and I've been to gigs where there have been five or six people there, but he has an ability to treat those five or six the same as they were 20 or 30,000 and amuse them 
and entertain them and move them to laughter and tears um, in the same way. And that's, uh, you know, that sort of um, ability to entertain is something that, you know, all actors and entertainers strive for. Um, and that, uh, that is his success. Um, and he is, he is totally unique, you know, and a very lovable um, uh, person and somebody that, that immediately warms people because he takes on uh, the, the, the sort of role of being the, the downtrodden and the loser and um, sends himself up as well as being, you know, sort of um, a rocker. You know, it's a unique combination, but a combination that hasn't to date been totally commercially successful, you know. Even though he's done the same act for 20 years, he's always in his head a couple of jumps ahead of, of what's going on, you know. It wouldn't surprise me if there's an Otway CD-ROM on the way, you know, he's, or, or an internet Otway, uh, you know, club. You know, he's, he's there in, in advance. He's very techni technically advanced, you know, and he's, he's got a mathematical brain. He can sort of see things coming and... Uh, um, and he, he is always thinking ahead, never, never sitting back, you know. And he has had to struggle quite hard to sort of keep um, himself going, you know, and uh, has been a success. Um, why do you feel people still go and they, they're going to know the same, he's going to do the same song, he's going to, you know, pull the guitar lead from so-and-so and... Because he has this ability, which um, uh, great actors have as well, to make it... Um, appear as if it is happening at that moment. And he sort of teeters on this edge of, of, of you thinking, oh, he's going to completely fall flat on his face. So there's that sort of tension of thinking he's going to blow it. And, and yet he's in command as well, in complete control, and knows the, the moment when... I mean, I can remember that the, the, the one that had me in tears the first time I saw him was um, he was singing a song and then just ripped his shirt open and the shirt button flew across the theatre and I thought, oh, it was just creased me up, you know. And, I, I, and um, there are lots of points in, in, the, in the live act that, um, you know, work completely. And, uh, you know, that, 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 I mean, as I said, I've seen it hundreds of times and I'm sure if I went again, it would be the same songs and I'd enjoy it just as much. You know, I've never, never seen a dull show. You know, he never sells anyone short, which is a, a, a form of integrity, really, you know, for what he does.